Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Audrey from the Animal and Veterinary Service, a cluster of the National Parks Board, and I will be your moderator for today. The webinar will be starting soon, and a gentle reminder to please keep your microphones muted. The main chat box will also be disabled during this time. If you face any technical issues, please message the user name tech support. And if you have questions at any point in time during the webinar, please message the user named Q&A. Uh, thank you for your patience as we wait for our final participants to join us this evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Science Behind Animal Behaviour webinar series, where we will be focusing on the ethology of dogs. We are very, very pleased to have with us again, Dr. Christina Spalding as the speaker for today. Christina is a certified applied animal behaviorist and has been in the dog training and behavior profession for over 20 years. She has a PhD in biopsychology, where she studies the biological basis of behavior and how it can be applied to prevention and early intervention of problem behavior in dogs. Christina teaches regularly on the science of animal behavior in causes and conferences, and she also sits on the board of the IABC Foundation and the Fear Free Advisory Group. Hence, we are really excited to have her here today, again, to share her expert knowledge in the field of canine ethology. I'm sure all of you in this Zoom session are very keen to ask her questions, and you may do so by typing in the chat box to the user named Q&A at any time during the session. A gentle reminder again to please mute your microphones, um, during the webinar, and thank you very much. Without further ado, I shall hand the time over to Christina. Christina, please. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be back and welcome back. So yesterday, we talked a little bit about the beha behavior of dogs in general, behavior of stray dogs, and then the stress that they face and how that can impact their quality of life. So we maybe left things on a little bit of a, of a sad um, or stressful note yesterday, but today is all about how we can make li life better for these guys. So this is a much more positive talk. Uh, and the information from yesterday should help set the groundwork for what we're going to talk about today. However, if you haven't watched that yet, no fear, um, you, can, you should still be able to understand this talk and then it will be available on YouTube as well. So we will just get right into it. The first thing I wanna do is talk about enrichment. We talk about enrichment a lot in terms of a, a way of improving life in dogs. So I wanna talk about what it is and why it's so important. So usually, so there's it's kind of a few different definitions of enrichment in the scientific literature, but generally the definitions include anything that improves, well, not anything, but one of the things that enrichment has to do is improve well-being. And essentially what that means is that we're wanting to generate positive emotions in animals. So not just relieve suffering, that's important too, but that brings them to neutral, right? So with enrichment, what we're actually trying to do is, is make them happier, essentially. And so the other aspect of enrichment is giving dogs an increased opportunity to engage in species typical behaviors. And so I'm going to talk about what that is. Uh, there are two types of enrichment. The first one is environmental enrichment. This means making sure that they have access to uh, a varied environment, an environment that's dynamic and changing and has different things going on, different things to do. So rather than just being in a barren cage, they have, you know, social interaction and toys and ideally access to natural areas. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. And then cognitive enrichment is giving them challenges, cognitive challenges um, that are positive. Last time we talked about good stress. This would fall into the category of good stress. And the cognitive enrichment we're going to talk about a lot more later on this evening. So species typical behavior is behavior that is already in an animal's natural repertoire. So this is something that dogs naturally do. And so examples of this would be things like running, jumping, digging, and hunting. And of course, we're not saying we, we want to have them engage in all of these. I don't expect people to take their dogs out and just let them go hunting. Uh, but some of these things 
we can either let them do um, or we can replicate in various ways. And at the end of the talk today, I'm going to give you a number of very specific examples of, of how we can do this. Another really big one is interaction with the natural environment. And the easiest way to do this is to give dogs access to natural areas. Now, depending on where you live and what your situation is, this may be, you know, easy or quite difficult. So again, we always want to try and work within what's realistic for any particular person. But even if you're in an urban setting, if you have any way to get them into a park um, or any other, you know, area where they can kind of sniff around and interact and even letting them sniff around on, on the, the urban, uh, you know, landscape is helpful too, because they're still engaging that sniffing. But when possible, if we can get them into natural areas, that's ideal. And so many pet dogs essentially live in a box, right? So um, they have limited access to outside. Uh, and that might be, you know, they're probably going outside, but they either have a limited space that they're confined to, um, or usually they have both limited space that they're confined to and limited amount of time outside. And when we're talking about former stray dogs in particular, this is really, really important because they used to have you know, full access to the outdoors and, and now they've lost that. Uh, so that is a concern. Uh, and when they are outside, the environment, environment that they're in may be fairly static and unchanging. And again, this is going to depend on the individual situation. Uh, but if they have a relatively small yard or garden um, that, you know, is sort of not a lot of things are going on in that environment that's relatively static or if they're taking the same route the same walk every day uh, there may not be tons of change again this is going to depend a lot on the individual situation and then you know a lot of dogs don't have a lot of opportunity to engage in species typical behavior so often these behaviors are viewed as problematic behaviors so digging for example or barking or chewing um, often this leads to conflict with the people in the household. And so one of the challenges we have is if we want to make sure we're giving our animals a good life is we have to find a way of channeling that need to engage those behaviors in a way that's appropriate and, and works for our actual life. And then um, finally, in many cases, these dogs have very limited control over their lives and sort of everything that they, they do is kind of being controlled by the humans in their life and they don't have a lot of choice. And we're going to talk about this more later as well. So, uh, so that's sort of, the, again, setting the picture here, right? So that's what enrichment is. I just went over the ways, sort of the challenges that a lot of dogs are facing in terms of things that may be limiting their welfare and their well-being. Um, more their well-being because welfare, they're probably getting medical care and fed and water and shelter and all of that. But if we really want to make them happy, then we want to add in these additional things. And so uh, with cognitive enrichment, that is one aspect of enrichment that can be really helpful for improving quality of life for our dogs. And so in order to fully understand this, I want to talk first about this thing called cognitive bias. So we know from the research that animals like humans can be optimistic or pessimistic. So optimistic animals tend to anticipate reward when faced with uncertainty. Pessimistic animals, on the other hand, tend to anticipate punishment when faced with uncertainty. So if they're not quite sure what's going to happen, the more optimistic animals are going to tend to think it's going to be something good, and the more pessimistic animals are going to tend to think that it's going to be something bad. And we, we know from studies in people that there's this connection between how, you know, this sort of assumption of reward or assumption of punishment and emotion. And so what researchers are starting to do in animals is use this bias as an indicator of positive emotions. 
And so we can't, it's kind of hard to do this with an individual pet dog, but I'm just sort of laying, you know, providing you guys with the framework of, of how we're getting to this information and why this is important to sort of telling a story here. So in humans, um, as I said, we know that there's a connection between emotional state and cognition. And so probably unsurprisingly, uh, people who experience more negative emotions also tend to have a negative cognitive bias, right? So they're assuming punishment uh, when the situation's unclear and people who have more positive emotions tend to have a more positive cognitive bias. And so probably the same is true for other animals as well. And so we want to try and create situations that are generating this positive cognitive bias, which means they're more optimistic uh, and therefore more positive emotions. Also, optimism is associated with better stress coping. So yesterday we talked about all of the sort of things that can go wrong when dogs are experiencing excessive stress and we can't always control the stress in their lives or our lives, but if they're more optimistic, they can cope with that stress better, which is really, really important. So this is where enrichment comes in. We know that increased enrichment makes animals more optimistic. And this has been found in multiple different species. Um, there's been a little bit of work in dogs that I'll talk about in a second. But if you give animals the opportunity for cognitive and environmental enrichment, it makes them more optimistic. And that should therefore create more positive emotions. We can't get directly at emotions in dogs, right? Because we can't ask them. So that's why they're looking at, at this instead of trying to measure the emotions because we really can't directly measure emotions. Uh, one thing also that I think it is important to be aware of is that if you take an animal from a very enriched environment, so stray dogs, for example, um, even though they are facing stressors, they are living in a very enriched environment. And if you transfer them to a more barren environment, that is actually worse than if they had always been living in a barren environment. So they're losing something. Uh, instead of just sort of never having it in the first place. And so, again, this is just sort of an argument saying making sure that we're providing enrichment is really, really important. And this, of course, is important for dogs that weren't initially stray dogs too, right? So if we look at some um, research about how do we enrich this environment, you know, these are some studies that have been done both in rats and beagles, and they've enriched the environment with various different things. So this is actually in uh, environmental enrichment, simply doing things like adding toys into the environment, giving uh, this is probably for the rats, but it could work for dogs too, is giving them tunnels to explore. Uh, you know, you could create sort of obstacles that the dogs can, can interact with. And then having the opportunity to interact with other animals of their own species is also important. And what they found is that there's this relationship between the environment and the cognition has that also improved their cognitive performance? So when you put them through various cognitive tests to, to sort of test how well they, they, they think and problem solve, uh, the animals from an enriched environment were able to perform better. And this is also important because we know from other studies that uh, improved problem solving skills also leads to better stress coping. There's been some really interesting studies that have been done in pigs. Uh, pigs are of interest because they're livestock, and so there's a lot of interest in livestock welfare. And um, what they did, I'm not going to, this is kind of complicated, so I'm not going to go into details of exactly how it worked, but they basically created this sort of auditory puzzle for the pigs, and they had to figure out that they had their own unique tone, and when that tone played, they could get access to food. And so what they found is that once the pigs figured this out, so it used to be that they would just feed all of the pigs at once in a big like bin feeder. Um, and then they changed it to this, just not a huge change, um, but they changed it so that the food was available sort of at different times and the pigs had to figure out which tone was theirs. So they knew when to go get their food and just doing that 
Um, de decreased excitement, this kind of means emotional arousal uh, and fear. So they were sort of less on edge. Um, it actually sped up wound healing. And so the researchers concluded that this increased well being in pigs. This is a pretty small thing that had clear measurable impacts on the well being of the pigs. They've done similar tests um, in cows and goats as well. And then there's a little bit of work in dogs, which I think I have. Oh, I didn't have a slide on this, but they've also done some work in dogs where they've kind of given them uh, puzzles to solve and that having the ability to go in and solve those puzzles and succeed at it um, also seem to improve their um, positive anticipation of that exercise. Whereas the dogs that couldn't solve a puzzle, they had an unsolvable puzzle, puzzle uh, that was not as effective. And those dogs did not show, um, they sort of became more pessimistic. Okay, um, so when we're offering enrichment, we need to make sure that we're offering an appropriate level of enrichment because if we don't do this well, uh, we can actually create more problems than we solve. So when we think about challenge, it's important to remember that animals actually evolved to cope with challenge, um, or to put this another way, they evolved to cope with stress. And so, you know, in the natural world, they're out there doing challenging things. They have to find food. They have to navigate social interactions. And you, you can probably think in your own life, sometimes social interactions are very challenging. Um, the environment is changing from season to season uh, and from year to year. And so these are presenting all kinds of challenges that the animals have to solve every single day. And so that is what we're used to. And so when we talk about this good stress, it really is good stress. It's not just neutral. It, it actually seems like facing and solving these challenges is actually very important to well-being. And so if we're if we're not providing, this is a little tricky here because we have to find this balance. If we're not providing enough stress, enough good stress, that's also problematic. Uh, whereas obviously if they're under, you know, stress that's more than they can handle, making it toxic stress, then that's not good either. But you don't want to eliminate any kind of challenge because then the dogs are just going to be, you know, bored and apathetic. Uh, and so that's going to lead to boredom and decreased welfare. And of course, in many cases, the dogs are going to end up finding their own entertainment, which is usually not what we want them to be doing for entertainment. So uh, how do we think about this? How do we figure out the best way to provide appropriate enrichment for our dogs? So Researchers Meehan and Mensch, they're animal welfare, well-being researchers, and uh, they came up with this lovely little chart. And so we talk about high challenge, high skill, uh, high challenge, low skill, and then low challenge, high skill, and low challenge, low skill. And I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn. So if you have a dog that doesn't have a lot of skills, so you know this could be that they simply... Um, it could be that they're not very intelligent, but more likely is that they just haven't had an opportunity to learn how to do certain things um, or certain things in that context. And they're not being provided with a lot of challenge. Um, you, you tend to get this sort of apathy is they're just not really engaged in the world around them. Uh, and so you, I don't want to say this is exactly like depression because they're dogs and they're not people and there's probably differences in how they experience the world, but something kind of similar to that, right? There's not a lot of engagement or pleasure in the world around them. Then you can have high skill, low challenge. And this is probably more often what we see where the dog has these cognitive capabilities that they, they need to be challenged and they're not getting that 
right? And so that can result in boredom. And again, um, frequently they're going to find their own form of entertainment, like barking out the window or tearing things up. Uh, and that's usually not what we want them to be doing. Then you have low skill, high challenge. And this is when a dog is faced with a challenge that they really do not have the skills to successfully solve. And this is also common. So you can have both of these things. You can have in the same dog, a dog that has high skill and low challenge in one context and has low skill and high challenge in another context. So you can have two different kinds of mismatches. So an example of what this might look like, let's say you're walking your dog on leash through the neighborhood and um, the dog is barking and lunging at other dogs. They may not, I mean, this is a very challenging situation, right? And the dog may not actually have the ability to stop doing that without some sort of more structured training. And so essentially, at least in the moment, I don't mean forever, but in that moment, given the skill level that the dog has, that problem is unsolvable. And that can lead to frustration and anxiety, which actually is going to exacerbate this barking and lunging unleash. And um, it's not just dogs that can experience this, right? So the human may also be experiencing low skill and high challenge in this situation. And when I say low skill, right, I don't mean that this, this individual person that's having this experience is not skilled at anything or that they're not intelligent. It simply means that they don't currently have the knowledge and the skill set to solve this problem. And they may need some help to do so, but they could become very skilled um, with some, some education and, and practice, right? So this these when we're talking about these different scenarios, they're certain they're not permanent. They're very changeable. Um, but they do have impacts on behavior. So, so far we've gone through three different scenarios and none of them are great. So the last one, oh, and that was just to remind me to talk about how this can also impact people. So the last one is high skill, high challenge, and this is actually what we want. So this is something that is challenging. It's hard, it's not easy. And the animal has the skills to succeed at that challenge. And so our job as, as dog owners is to really try to create this situation. And this is often going to be some trial and error. You know, you may try and create the situation and then realize that it was too easy or too hard. And then you have to adjust. And this is a constant thing. Um, us professional dog trainers are constantly making a judgment or adjustments to try and stay um, in this sort of section of that that chart that I showed you. So don't expect, you know, it don't be hard on yourself if you're trying to do this and you're not hitting it every time because you won't. Um, that's the <laughs> that's the challenge, right? Um, so this is high challenge again for the people too. This is what we want. This is the the sort of sweet spot that is going to help really improve well-being uh, for dogs and consequently improve it for people too. So in this case, the skill level and the challenge level are really well matched. And so this allows animals to achieve mastery. And I, I will say on this slide, the other slides are, we have really good convincing research on this and animals. Uh, this particular slide, we have evidence of this in humans. This hasn't been directly tested in animals. Uh, but again, there's so much overlap, you know, humans are mammals, dogs are mammals. And so there's a lot of overlap in behavior, really a very shocking amount. Um, so it, I don't think it's totally, um, total guesswork to say that seems likely that dog could, dogs could have positive emotions because they've mastered a particular behavior or skill. If nothing else, it reduces the anxiety of not being able to cope in that moment, right? Um, and so being having the skills to um, meet these challenges successfully is going to be reinforcing and is going to promote 
this sort of active engagement with the environment and this flexible species typical behavior, which is really important. And so I guess I would argue that we they can master skills, right? It's this last part here that we have really not, we don't directly have evidence of this in dogs. Um, but the researchers question, you know, can other animals achieve this state called flow? This is something that people experience uh, where you're sort of, you're so absorbed in a task um, that you're really not thinking about other things. You're just, you're kind of in the zone and you're, you're doing something that you're really, really good at, you know exactly what to do. It's easy. It all comes very naturally and it's very reinforcing. It's a very positive emotional state. We don't know if dogs can achieve this, um, but certainly these first two points, the ability to have increased confidence and succeed at something difficult and have that be reinforcing and um, to improve your ability to cope with other stresses that we have good evidence for. All right, so that is the aspect of enrichment about control. That's, or sorry, um, of appropriate challenge. That's what we kind of want to try and get at with challenge. Now I'm going to talk more about control. So um, part of the definition for enrichment, remember, is having control over the environment. And um, there is a model that was put together by a couple of researchers that I think is really helpful for illustrating exactly why control is so important. So um, Mascarell and Hartley are, they're suggesting that when an animal enters a new environment, they make an estimate of agency. And so what that means is they're, they're trying to make an educated guess essentially about how much control they're likely to have in this environment. And that estimate, that estimate of perceived control or agency is going to influence their behavior. So this would vary from context to context, but it also tends to generalize. So if an animal is experienced, um, has a history of, of not really being able to do much about their circumstances, then they're gonna assume that that's true in other environments as well, right? And vice versa as also. So one of these profiles that you have is this proactive way of engaging with the environment. And so Moscarell and Hartley suggest that these animals essentially approach these environments with this attitude of what can I do in this environment? And it, we don't, we're not necessarily saying that they're literally having this thought process in their head, but that's kind of what the, what's reflected in the behavior. And so with these guys, so we're going to say these guys are optimistic, right? Because when faced with uncertainty, they see new opportunities for reinforcement. And so they display more exploratory and more flexible behavior. Uh, and we keep talking about flexible behavior, but again, that's really important for being able to cope well with stress because you can change strategies if something isn't going well. And then... Um, they also have show more goal-directed behavior. And we won't have time today to, to get into this really detailed distinction of what goal-directed behavior is, but this is essentially intentional behavior where the animals have a specific goal and they are engaging in behavior in an attempt to achieve that goal. So if there's food on the counter and the animal is trying, actively trying to figure out how to get it, that would be an example of goal-directed behavior. This type of approach is beneficial in environments that are safe uh, and the animal has a high level of control. And really, this is generally what we want. We, we want animals to view uncertainty with sort of this assumption of possible reinforcement. We want them to be willing to explore their environment and to be flexible. Because if they're not doing this right, that's gonna lead to problems. So if your dog is scared of every new thing that they encounter, that's going to make their life worse and make them harder to live with. Uh, and if, you know, again, if they're not able to be as flexible, uh, that's gonna lead to higher levels of stress, which is gonna increase the likelihood that they have behavior issues. The other way of interacting with their environment is to be reactive. And Mascarell and Hartley suggest that these guys approach the world with this um, 
in a way that is consistent with this idea of what can this environment do to me? This is very different, right, than this idea. What can I do in this environment? Now we're saying, what can this environment do to me? And again, we're not literally saying this is what the dogs are thinking because we have no idea, but the behavior is consistent um, with that statement. And so these guys are perceiving uncertainty as potential threat, right? So that makes them more pessimistic. And as a result, in unfamiliar environments, they're going to tend towards defensive behaviors. So this could be freezing and avoidance, for example, where they are fearful and they're trying to avoid things. And of course, if that's not going to work, then we make it escalate to growling, snarling, snapping, biting. Uh, these behaviors, the advantage of these behaviors, because there is an advantage to them, is that they're, they're very rapidly initiated. So if you are actually in a threatening environment, you really don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about and deciding which behavior you want to engage in. You need to respond quickly so that you can protect yourself. Uh, and so these guys are, you're going to tend to see more habitual behavior. And again, I don't, we don't have a ton of time to get into the details of what this is. Um, this is also sometimes called stimulus response behavior, but habitual behaviors are sort of automatic responses that don't involve a lot of thinking and consideration. So these are things that animals just do habitually. Um, I think we know what habit is because the way that we use it in normal conversation is, is actually correct, is that it's hard to break habits, right? Because they're happening automatically and there's not a lot of thinking involved. And that makes these behaviors harder to change and more rigid because there's not a lot of thinking involved. Uh, and so this response is going to be beneficial in low control environments where engaging in exploration and trying out different things isn't gonna help anyway. So why waste that energy, right? And so, um, this is not an ideal place for our dogs to be in, uh, typically, especially when they're not actually in a threatening environment, right? Um, if they actually have the ability to avoid harm to themselves, but they're responding as if they don't, or the only way they can avoid harm is by freezing and, and becoming defensive, this is not a great place to be in. And the difference is control. The difference is how much control do they perceive? And this is why it's really important that we are giving some control to our dogs. And I'm going to talk more specifically about this um, now, actually. So um, I said before that I was going to give you some specific examples of enrichment. So to summarize, good enrichment involves uh, species specific behavior. So making sure that dogs have the opportunity to engage in behaviors that are natural uh, is really important or that they mimic natural behavior. So again, I'm not, not advocating for letting your dog go chase down and hunt animals, but there are ways that we can mimic that. Uh, if you're trying to assess, am I at is the enrichment that I'm doing actually helpful and beneficial to my dog? You want to look at, do you feel like it's increasing well-being? So do they seem happier when, after they've done these things or while they're doing these things? And then you want to think about, is this appropriate for my dog? Is this well-matched? Uh, and, you know, to try and assess that is you want them to be able to succeed pretty quickly. So if you're, if you've tried something two or three times and the dog still isn't getting it, it's, it's probably a little bit too hard and you want to try something a little bit easier. So if, if you're trying to do a, <laughs> and they're really good at a, and that's easy and it's really not a challenge for them. And then you try something um, let's say you go to sort of level D, maybe I should give you guys a more specific example. We're just going to go with a really easy stay, right? So if your dog can do a five second stay and that's really easy for them, and then you jump to 15 seconds and they're just getting up over and over again, you went too far. And so now we have high challenge, low skill. And so we have to find something between five and 15 seconds. And so you might try 10, that might still be too hard, um, but you could try it. 
And then, you know, if they still can't do that, then maybe we go down to like six or seven seconds, make sure they succeed at that, get really solid at that. And then once that's easy, then you would go up a little bit higher. And so that's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about appropriate challenge. And again, this is, <laughs> this is easier said than done. So this is a challenge for people as well. And we're just always having to adjust. And then um, increasing agency and control is also really important. And so what, that's what we kind of, this is the different things we want to hit when we're engaging in enrichment. So here are some options for indoor enrichment. And uh, I believe that a number of different links just went into the chat um, to give you guys some additional resources. And I also believe they're gonna be posted uh, in the sort of description information on YouTube. So one form of enrichment is positive reinforcement training, right? So this means that we're asking for a behavior and then we're rewarding the behaviors that we like. And there's many different ways that we can do this. Um, this is a partial list, it's not a complete list, but these are some of the things that maybe are, are a little bit easier to get into without a ton of equipment and space. So just teaching tricks is enrichment. You just don't wanna do the same thing over and over again, right? So if you teach your dog to spin um, and roll over on cue, and then you stop there, and that's the only thing you ever ask, once they know those behaviors really well, it's not enrichment anymore. So you have to keep working on different behaviors. Uh, scent work is teaching your dog to find a specific scent. Uh, and this is something that can be done inside or outside. This is um, mimics natural behavior, right? And so they're engaging their nose, they're, this mimics hunting. So this is a really nice naturalistic behavior. Tricks, of course, are not super naturalistic, except that it is a cognitive challenge. And so you are, um, you're asking your dog to engage in problem solving. And so that's, you know, sort of species typical. Uh, this, <laughs> This one's not totally species. I mean, it's it's very far removed in general, but that that engagement of the brain still falls into the category. Then you have cooperative care, which is teaching your dog to sort of voluntary per, voluntarily participate in things like grooming and vet care. There's books out there. I can't believe I can't remember if I put the book in the resource list. Uh, I think I did. There's a cooperative care book by Deb Jones simply teaching them basic manners so that they can kind of engage with their normal world more effectively and more appropriately. Um, and then, you know, teaching more formal competitive obedience and then something called team. And again, that, that information is in the links for you guys. And then um, puzzle boxes. So this is something, so you can buy puzzles for your dogs. You can also just make them at home. You, you know, you can put together boxes and put treats in boxes. And then they, you know, they have to pull apart the boxes to get to the treats. Um, you can put treats in boxes and hide the boxes. You just remember appropriate challenge. You have to start really, really easy sometimes ridiculously easy and very gradually increase the challenge from there. If your dog is giving up, it's probably too hard. Um, and then food enrichment toys. So this is things like uh, Kongs and I don't know if you guys have Kongs over there, but they're you know toys that you can put food in and the dog has to manipulate the toy in some way to get food. So. Puzzle boxes are very similar. These two things are very closely related. Uh, the one caveat that I will make to this is once the dog figures out the puzzle, if you don't change it, it's no longer technically enrichment, right? Because it's not a challenge. They, they know what they need to do. They just have to do it. It might slow them down, which is fine. I mean, there may be times you just want to use them to entertain your dog and that's fine. Um, but it no longer technically counts as enrichment if it is no longer a challenge, a, a, a cognitive challenge. And then seek and find games. This is puzzle box, again, sort of similar. If you're hiding your puzzle boxes, you can teach them to find toys. You can just simply hide food around the house for them to find. Um, you can hide yourself. So playing hide and seek with the dog uh, where the people hide and call the dog. 
uh, tracking type games. There's there's a lot of variations here on on what you can do, and I have a couple of blog posts in those resources that that go into this in more detail. And then play play is a form of enrichment. Uh, so tug there's some. Um, Myths out there about tug being a bad thing and, and tug teaching dogs to be aggressive. That's not actually true. Uh, you do want to make sure you're teaching, you know, your dog to drop the items on cue. Uh, and there's, um, you, you can, there's, this is not in the um, resources, but Shirag Patel has a really beautiful video on teaching drop it. It's, it's C-H-I-R-A-G is the first name and Patel, P-A-T-E-L is the last name. And if you search for his name and drop it, you will find his video if you need help teaching that. Um, personal play, that's just you and the dog playing and then fetch if you have space for it, right? And of course, not all dogs are gonna engage in play, but this should give you a variety of options. And then outside, um, that we have a lot of options as well. So sniff, sniff walk. So this is just going on a walk without having any particular agenda um, and letting the dog spend as much time as they want sniffing, which for some dogs, <laughs> I have a, a, a beagle and um, we don't get very far when we do this, but that's okay. Cause it's not for me. It's, it's for the dog. So sniff walks can be helpful. <clears throat> Again, getting them access to natural areas is ideal, but if you can't do that, just letting them sniff where they are. Um, field trips, what I mean by that is taking them to different places. So if you always take the same walk or you always go to the same park, try and switch that up periodically. That can be really beneficial because now they're getting something new. Um, play dates with other dogs, if possible, if you have access to other friendly dogs. Um, Agility, right? We're going through jumps and over tunnels and things like that. Again, that requires a fair amount of space. So you have to have a place where you can do that. Um, scent work and seek and find games and play can all be done outside as well. And then there's this thing called a flirt pole, which is basically a stick uh, or a pole. And then on the end of the pole is a bungee that is attached to a toy. And you can take that stick and you can move it around really quickly and flip it up in the air and do all these things and make it kind of move like a wild animal and the dogs can chase it. And then once they get it, they can tug. Uh, and this is a really nice uh, form of play that a lot of dogs love. It's nice because you don't need a ton of space. And again, it kind of mimics that, that hunting. It's very naturalistic. And many dogs that won't engage in other types of play will engage with flirt poles. So that is an option. You can, uh, at least here in the US, you can get these made commercially and just purchase them online on Amazon or something and, and get them that way. All right, and then the last thing is ways of increasing agency and control. And so, this involves things like letting the dog choose their toys, you know, giving them an option. Do you want to play with this toy or this toy? Letting them choose. You can let them choose their treats uh, or simply just letting them choose what direction they want to go on their walk um, or where they want to sleep. And, you know, that's within reason, right? So it doesn't mean you have to let your dog like sleep on your pillow so that you have nowhere to sleep. But you know, giving them options for where they're going to sleep. And one, one thing that comes up a lot is sometimes we want our dogs to be with us in the room with us or cuddling with us and they don't want to and respecting that too, right? That's another way of giving them increased control is that when they don't want to hang out with us, that we let them have some space. And that one's really hard for a lot of people, including me. Um, training is also a way of increasing control. So what it does is it teaches the dog that their behavior matters. It teaches them that there are certain things that they can do to get something good, to get reinforcement. And so the more you do that, the more they learn that their behavior matters, and that is going to improve uh, welfare and well-being. And then if you have a dog that's better trained, you're going to be able to take them more places and do more things with them. So it also improves other opportunities for enrichment. Uh, and then also respecting their boundaries, which again is sort of like if they don't wanna interact with you or they don't like a certain kind of interaction, making sure that you respect that. There is a limit to this. So 
again, this doesn't mean that you should let your dog do whatever they want and that there's no boundaries and you kind of, you know, let them misbehave or do things that are not safe or dangerous, but there are things we can do to increase their control. All right, so I know I'm a little over, so I'm just gonna uh, rush or run through this quickly. Uh, so enrichment can make animals more optimistic. Uh, that will result in more positive emotions and decrease their anxiety and fear and improve their ability to cope with stress, which is going to in turn um, make them happier and decrease behavior issues. And the best types of enrichment are those that increase control, are well suited for the individual, uh, and there are many different ways that we can do that. I just, I just want to make a point, you know, everything in this slide, if your dog has really serious behavior issues, if they're really seriously frightened or they are showing a lot of aggression, this is probably not going to be enough on its own. Uh, you probably are going to need to consult with a qualified trainer or behaviorist, but this is a nice way to get started. And for dogs that don't have serious behavior issues this could make a big difference. All right. So that is it for the lecture portion of today's presentation. And now I can take questions. Thank you so much, Christina, for your presentation. We had Thank such you. an interesting uh, time today uh, listening to the talk. So now we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, let's go to the first question. Would enrichment, for example, giving access to the outdoors differ between breeds, given that different breeds can differ quite substantially in terms of size and behavior? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. And we do not know the answer to that question. Uh, so this is something that hasn't been studied. What I would say is that the most important thing is to look at your individual dog. So I have a beagle, for example. I have two dogs. One is a beagle and he really, really, really wants to sniff. Uh, and the other dog doesn't care nearly as much about sniffing. So your dogs are going to tell you what they want to do. And then you can use that information to decide what kinds of enrichment you want to do with them. Most dogs love scent work. I had a dog, client's dog that I worked with, and that dog couldn't care less about, I mean, he was just not interested in scent work at all. Um, so we found other things to do with him that he was interested in. So some dogs are very easy. They'll kind of do whatever you want. Uh, other dogs have very clear preferences. So just pay attention to what they're telling you and use that to guide your choices. Yep. Okay, for the next question, in a shelter setting, how often do you think enrichment should be given to dogs living in kennels? Yeah, so shelters are, are challenging, right? Because there's, there's a number of different things that go on that limit our ability to give them adequate enrichment. So I'm going to kind of give you the ideal answer and then, you know, recognizing that many shelters aren't going to be able to do the ideal and then you're just going to have to do the best that you can. But, uh, you know, I, I would say daily. I mean, they really need to get out of their kennels and ideally get outside on a daily basis. Uh, there are programs available to teach shelters how to set up safe and effective play groups with other dogs. And then you can also do things in the kennel by providing toys and beds and things like that to add some enrichment in the kennel. And even, you know, taking them out, like if you don't have a lot of outdoor space, taking them out and having them interact with staff and volunteers in, you know, visiting rooms, doing training or, or having um, I can't remember what they call it. I think some shelters have a little word they use for it, but like having them do office visits, right? Where this dog gets to hang out in the office for a few hours and then another dog gets to come in. And of course that's gonna depend on the dog being able to handle that situation, uh, but really daily. I mean, in an ideal world, they should be getting enrichment every single day. Yep. Um, the next question is, do dogs need to be off leash during outdoor enrichment? Like when they're sniffing or socializing with other dogs? Yeah, I mean, again, ideally, <laughs> I mean, I think it is really, really beneficial for dogs to have the opportunity to run off leash. It's going to depend. Some dogs, that's less important than others. Um, but it has to be safe, right? So that's the challenge is if you have an area 
where you can safely let dogs off leash, then I would absolutely do that. Um, if you don't, then you're going to have to find other solutions and you can get long lines uh, that you can put your dogs on. I would use a harness instead of having it attached to the collar, which goes around the neck. Because if they're going full speed, that can be a problem. But you you have to have a dog that can handle that too, right? So we wouldn't want to put a really fearful dog or a very reactive or aggressive dog on a long leash um, in an area where they're likely to encounter other people or dogs because that's not going to be safe. Um, but if you have a place you can go where there's not, you know, you're very unlikely to encounter other people or you can stay away from them, uh, then putting them on a long leash. I don't know what the leash laws are like uh, in the various communities that the listeners are in, but if, if you have a safe legal place to let your dog off leash and you're very confident that your dog is safe uh, and they will come when called, you can do that. But that's not always realistic. And so then we can try and find other ways of, of meeting their enrichment needs. Okay, um, the next question. Could how optimistic or pessimistic an individual be biased by its temperament? Because some people are more melancholic and some are more sanguine. Yeah. Yes. Um, we don't really know the answer. I, I do, there's been some research on this in humans, and I do believe that there's some evidence of a genetic influence. I don't think anyone's looked at this at all in dogs, but there is some at least speculation in the literature that some of what we're seeing when we're seeing a dog that's more optimistic or pessimistic may actually reflect differences in their sensitivities to reward and punishment. So if you have a dog, um, for example, that's particularly sensitive to punishment, they may come off as more pessimistic because they're that's very salient and noticeable to them. So uh, yeah, what, there are some complexities to that that we're own, that we're really haven't looked into in detail yet, but probably temperament plays a role in that as well. It's a mix of of genetics and environment. Yeah. Um, the next question is: What are some examples of high skill and high challenge in dogs? Yeah. So um, this is it's a little hard to give this example because it's going to depend on each individual dog, because it depends on what that dog's skill level is. But so some kind of easy examples are like, if you have an agility dog, right? And you're competing with that dog and you've, you've trained them very, very well. And they're going out into these sort of courses that differ from show to show. Uh, and they're, they're running these challenging courses and succeeding at them. That, that's one example. But then it can simply be, you know, continuing to teach new tricks, right? So you have a dog and you've taught them, we'll just go back to the examples of spin and roll over. You've taught them spin and roll over. They got that. They're good at it. It's easy now. And now you want to teach a new trick. And so now you start teaching them something new, but because you're doing it well, either because you have experience or you're using maybe some of the resources I gave you in the chat, um, they're able to succeed at it. And now they're learning this new trick and then that's going to build their skills. So now you can do a different trick that's maybe a little bit more challenging um, or teaching them, for example, a behavior at home and then going into an environment that's slightly more distracting and doing it in that environment and then going into a busier environment. And so it's, it's making sure that you're always I don't want to say always, but giving them opportunities and training where you're asking for a, just a little bit more. We don't always want to ask for more because that gets stressful, right? Like you don't want to, like you don't want to go to work every single day and have it be harder than the day before. Um, so you want things, and I think that's an important point. You want to make sure that you're also sometimes just doing things that are easy. We don't want to always make it harder because that becomes exhausting. But we want to make sure that they're having some opportunity on a regular basis to learn new things that they're also able to succeed at. Yep. Okay, the next question is, does the well-being of dogs depend on how lasting is the positive emotion or does it not matter? 
Um, yeah, that's a really, so there's actually a lot in that question. So probably what we're, what we're really going for, so emotions are brief. They don't really last very long. Mood, however, is longer. So we can be in a good mood for hours or days. Emotions are usually seconds or minutes. So probably what we really wanna look at is mood and does the duration of mood matter? And probably, I mean, it, it, if you're having more frequent positive experiences, it, it's somewhat frequency and it's somewhat mood. It, if you're having more frequent positive experiences and, and you're having longer lasting positive mood, that should contribute to well being. Having said that, the goal is not to keep the dogs in this constant state of like super happiness, right? Like just, again, think of yourselves. No one that I know goes through the world where they're just constantly really happy. You know, there, things are going to change. And a lot of time, you know, if you're feeling a really strong, intense emotion, that's exhausting, even if you're happy. And so we don't want we don't want to keep them in this constant state of arousal. Like sometimes just sort of calm, good mood is, is fine. Um, and neutral, I think is okay too. We just want to kind of minimize, minimize those negative uh, experiences, but I wouldn't feel bad if your dog is not constantly super happy. That's not, we're not looking for that. Okay, one last question that I just got in, um, not quite on enrichment, but on aggression. Um, so this person says that my dog is really aggressive on the leash when on walks with her, the owner, but totally not aggressive when on walks to someone else. And she's also totally not aggressive when off leash. So um, I think maybe to share some tips, if you can, on why this might be so. Yeah, so it's very common to have a dog that is aggressive uh, or displays certain behaviors on leash and then totally fine off leash. So that's not unusual at all. That's normal and probably, I mean, there are dogs that are aggressive in both contexts, but um, probably it has something to do with the leash. The leash is restricting, the leash is reducing control, and, and that's causing additional issues. In terms of it only happening with her, I'd probably have to ask a lot more questions to give a definitive answer, but what might be happening there is two things are kind of related is one is she, she, and I'm not blaming you at all, I promise, <laughs> but there may be certain things that you're doing um, that may have been cues for the behavior unintentionally or um, are somehow contributing to the behavior uh, or maybe you walk the dog more often and, than other people do. And so the dog has had the chance to build up that behavior with you and they just haven't practiced it as much with other people. Uh, and then I talked about habit before and habit, I'm trying to think of how to answer this quickly without going into a full explanation, which would take us over time. Habit becomes, habitual behaviors become controlled by the environment. And so that means if you remove certain um, cues, certain environmental features, that that habitual behavior might go away. And so, especially if the owner or, or whoever asked the question is the one that's primarily walking the dog and the dog has had a lot of opportunity to practice that behavior with that person, um, they may have been become part of the cue for that behavior. And when I say cue, I don't mean they're intentionally asking for it, but they've become part of that whole picture. And so then if you put someone else in there where the dog hasn't um, practiced the behavior as much, then you may not see the same behavior because the picture has changed just enough to change the behavior. Um, if this person doesn't walk the dog a lot and it only happens with them, that's a little bit harder to say without asking a lot more questions, but it, it, it could have something to do with experience. I mean, there's different possible explanations, but the, the ones I gave are the ones I see most commonly. Yep. Thank you so much, Christ Christina. And thank you for everyone who submitted a question. Um, I'm mindful that it's already nine. Uh, so we'll end the webinar here. We've come to the end for today. 
And we hope that you've enjoyed the webinars that we have for you over the last two days and learned some useful information on canine ethology. We certainly had a great time understanding more about our canine companions and what we can do to improve their overall welfare. Head over to our Facebook page, Animal Bus SG, for more educational information on animal ethology and like the page for regular content. If you did not manage to catch yesterday's session and also today, uh, you can view it live um, on, by visiting our NPARKS SG YouTube page or scanning and saving the QR code below. Thank you, everybody, for your time uh, and good night. Thank you, everyone.